simulated test marketing or um, if you will a technique that's used um, using either one of two uh, two different models that's available basis or assessor before you do an actual test market so you have a product um, concept that's gone through the process and has been vetted and uh, you have some preliminary prototypes hopefully and uh, you're trying to forecast the demand and uh, make a go no go decision um, at this point and you're trying to simulate the market you know, test market and uh, get some rudimentary feedback before you actually start to create ads and uh, create an actual test market and launch it let's say in Tucson or um, in uh, a larger market okay here's uh, how uh, let me give, start off with a small little case study of um, of a product that's gone through this and why demand forecasting is so important um, if you look at the first home video system and this is all out of Google that I just got uh, in order to create a small little mini case for you if you look at this first home video system it was extremely high-tech for 1963 um, but the cost was $30,000. Uh, you look at the beast that the person's carrying and you realize that it just is not conducive for, uh, for shooting home videos, even though it was called a home video system. Um, it included um, a color TV. Hopefully that's something that you already have right now. Uh, it con consists of a tuner, a turntable, and so forth. Technology has advanced in the last few years where uh, we can now do it on our portable uh, machines that we carry with us, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's a, a, a small little video camera that acts as um, a communications device and so forth. And um, it also required uh, installation where uh, you would require a person to actually come out to your place um, and set up this 900 pound system, right? So you're, uh, and if you wanted to carry this 900 pound system to oh, uh, shoot videos, uh, then that was up to you. So, that was 1963 when it first developed, and then by 1974, the whole home video war had started, and there were two different formats that were uh, that was vying for your attention, um, and uh, they were the beta format and the VHS format. Uh, Sony introduced the v beta format, um, and uh, they sold a few of the items to 30,000 of VCRs. And JVC came out with the VHS format, which is the, uh, uh, if you will, the competitor to this. And um, that took a couple of years, and then it went out to Sony versus JVC. And by 1981, um, VCRs had accounted for about 25% of the market, and uh, consumers were being warned that uh, VHS um, uh, would be slightly broader, there would be a lot more available. And by 1987, uh, one of those had um, lost out, which was the beta format, and uh, VHS and Sony, in fact, started to introduce its VHS line um, in its VCRs. And uh, during the time in the 70s too, Laserdisc started to make uh, a foray in the DVD format, um, and uh, there was uh, one last competitor that was uh, trying to get in uh, using the video disc, which is RCA. They started field testing in 1975, which was actually a test market, and then subsequent, we're talking about simulated test market, which is slightly different, but we'll get to why demand forecasting is important. And uh, 67, 76 and 77, they got extensive press on this, that this was um, a format that might uh, make some inroads into this uh, now a duopoly. And here was how it looked, uh, which was the RCA video disc player. Uh, you'd have these housed in about 16, uh, inch housing, so you can imagine how they look. Um, it used a needle uh, to read through the uh, disc surface, and um, about halfway through the movie, you had to flip it across so that uh, you could get the rest of it. There was no recording function, it was just a playback, so it was a consumption device rather than a production device. Uh, the home video, uh, the whole pro fight was uh, that you would, uh, you would produce and then consume, but in this case, it was just consumption, more for the movies that you would see. Um, and here was the demand forecast that they did. They conducted market research. They expected to sell about 200,000 players um, that year and about 2 million discs, which was the, uh, the number of discs uh, that each one of these players uh, would play multiple of these discs, and they expected 2 million discs. And, um, and they said that in 10 years' time, there'll be about 30 to 50 percent of the market uh, would own it, um, and they expected about $7.5 billion in sales. 
And here are a few qualitative comments as well. Our customer for EDS is clearly the average family. Really? Meaning I could, uh, I'll give you some indication of the price of these video discs for you to think if it's really for an average family. And the broad segment that builds a television business is going to go in for this, and that's about 16 million annual units of sales, and that was the RCA vice president, probably justifying his or her own position. And um, there was some industry data that basically some industry uh, people that said that basically these will reach a higher level of sales than anybody else. Here's what they did. Uh, the value proposition that they proposed in their ads was that it's easy to use, the depth of software is high, it's affordable. Um, they launched it uh, using 5,000 retail outlets. They had an initial uh, outlay of about $22 million in advertising, which at that point in time was uh, pretty high. Um, but here's the catch. The product for 19, um, the 70s and 80s uh, was priced at $500 for the player. And each of those movie titles that you would own in your home was anywhere from $50 to about $40. Uh, at that point, I think movie theaters, you could go and watch a movie at less than $5. Uh, so is it really worthwhile paying three, three to ten times the price um, to own the movie in your uh, home um, and to basically go through the effort of learning how to use this device, flipping over the, the movie during... Um, uh, the middle of the movie and setting up a home for this and at a lesser experience than what you get in a theater. Here's what happened. They sold about uh, 100,000 units because of its of the 22 million uh, uh, advertising blitz that they had, um, which is about half of their forecast. Um, VCRs by then, which was uh, uh, a slightly cheaper technology, um, had already taken off and typical consumer thought, why would I want a video desk when a uh, video disc player when uh, I could get VCRs that that both records and uh, plays, and at probably a cheaper price. Um, they didn't talk about uh, the, the video rental market in the market research, they didn't get feedback for that, and therefore consumers just looked at the concept and reacted to the concept without uh, uh, the competition thrown in. And um, the cumulative sales in 1984 was 500,000 units, uh, much less than the 16 million or whatever million units they were projecting. And by 1986, they had actually lost out on the market. They had, um, they had uh, accumulated a loss of about $580 million, and they were pulled out. Now, why did this happen? I think demand forecasting, at least for this product, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other technologies, the other products that were available, would have been uh, a crucial thing, at least for RCA, to cut their losses. Um, maybe that would have provided them with some pointers in terms of the segments that they could reach and get extract more out of. They got some pointers in terms of whether the price point was correct or not, especially given that the high price point that they launched the consumables, which was the video disc back. Um, and uh, to me, demand forecasting, at least at this stage when you're launching the product and you've got a concept and you've got the vetted prototypes and so forth, um, is extremely important before you start incurring these huge amount of losses. So some of the things that they could have done is try and do this, uh, find the market potential, find uh, how much they could commit uh, to back themselves to get this market potential, and what should they price it at, given that that's such an important determinant um, of demand forecast. So here's the question that I'll pose to you is, how do you forecast sales of this kind of service, which is either RCA's video disc or any other service, um, an iPad 3 that you see come out? And uh, can you uh, reliably um, back yourself if you do make a forecast. So here are two approaches. Uh, we've talked about one at least early on, which was basically if you had the market potential, then you could look at um, the growth of that over a period of time or how the, how the innovation would diffuse, and that was the diffusion model, the BAS model. And we talked about two, two parameters there, which was the um, innovation rate and the imitation rate that would lead to either fast or slow adoption of the product. And in hindsight, if the market had happened, then that would be the product life cycle that you could look at, look back on. Today, let's talk about a different technique, which is a survey-based technique when you have a little bit further along the development process. And we'll talk about two different techniques called the basis and the assessor, and I'll give you some pointers about how they do it. Um, and this, both of these are simulated test marketing techniques. But um, one of the inputs that comes in from a simulated test marketing is from the consumers and hence it's survey based. But we'll also talk about a second uh, source of uh, input and that is from actual marketers providing uh, that 
ad budgets and the retail budgets in order to uh, figure out how they could buy awareness and availability of the product. Mm. Okay. Here are some popular models that exist. We I told you about bases and assessor. Uh, there's another one uh, called Muse. So bases um, uh, was uh, developed by uh, Sammy Burke. Um, use survey data, use uh, extensively sales volume forecasting, assess, uh, and basis, uh, I think has been taken, um, has been purchased by AC Nielsen, is now part of AC Nielsen. Assessor uh, was by two professors at MIT, Silke and Urban, their first paper in JMR, which is a Journal of Marketing Research, led to a company being launched um, that started catering to industry's requirement in terms of forecasting, uh, shopping and uh, forecasting demand in uh, simulated shopping environment. And the third one, which was slightly later, was by Muse, um, probably less available and less used right now. All of these models use a hierarchy of effects model. And the hierarchy of effects uh, states that uh, people go through stages before they're ready to purchase. And even after they purchase, in order to repurchase a product, they go through some stages again. What are the stages? Um, typically, if you think about it, uh, we talk about the traditional model, and then we'll see how uh, it relates to today. The traditional model is that uh, you need to become aware of the product, so which means that advertising forms a function of making you aware of the product. And once you become aware of the product, you create some thoughts about the product, and so that's, uh, 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 and then you create some feelings about the product, and so one of, uh, and those probably lead you to try the product. And uh, for trial to happen, if you have thoughts and good feelings about the product, is the product should be within reach. And so um, distribution takes on that role and should be within your budget. So price takes on that role. And uh, if it is, and so those two P's of marketing, we talked about a different P, promotion before, and these two P's of marketing helps the fourth P, which is the product sell itself. And then you try the product. So you basically um, uh, take forecast some the initial money that uh, the product is priced at and is counted or a skimming value, whatever the amount is, and, and you get the product, you try it, and for often repeated purchase products, which is probably what most um, consumer products are, we're not talking about consumer durables, which are probably the, uh, uh, the, the time between purchase cycles are slightly longer, and then you can get into assets, which are probably much more longer, um, and uh, then you start repeat purchasing it, and between trial and repeat, you probably go through the awareness trial for this product vis-a-vis -vis other products too. Now, if you take this, there are three probabilities. The probability that you'll become aware conditional on the fact that you're unaware of the product. So if you went and advertised out of 100 people, let's say 10 people became aware, then the probability that somebody will become aware because of the advertising is 0.1, 10 by 100. Then conditional on the fact that you become aware of the product, how likely are you to try it? Let's say 100 people are aware of the product, only 10 try the product, then the probability is 0.1 again. Um, and if you try it, then what's the likelihood that you'll repeat purchase it? And for even for brands like Coke and Pepsi, the brand loyal consumers that will really choose that brand again and again in the subsequent purchase is not more than 0.5. Sometimes it is much lower than that. And then you have a floating population that will try your product along with others depending on um, their, uh, if you will, the consumption basket. So the three probabilities, probability of becoming aware, probability of becoming, uh, trying the product, condition on the fact that you're aware, probability of repeat purchasing it, condition on the fact you try. And so most of these techniques, whether it's basis or assessor, try and forecast these probabilities and multiply them together in order to be able to calculate on how much um, is the likely volumes that you're gonna generate, and if you incorporate price price in it, how much um, uh, dollar amounts you can expect. So, uh, so three probabilities, uh, and we sometimes you might be looking at long-term probabilities because the survey only tells you the short-term one short response the pr person provides, but in the long term, as people become aware of the product much more, uh, there's word of mouth effects, and the fact that this product uh, has been used by you a few times, uh, there's a long-term probability of you sticking to the product. And so there's, uh, that, that's a, there's a technique to use to, uh, to extract that out, and I'm just gonna uh, throw one, uh, technique out to you that we're not going to talk about. It's called the Markov process. Um, we'll keep that aside for now. So the probability of being a regular consumer is a combination of these three probabilities. That you work with the people with the probability of awareness and condition the fact that somebody's aware, you try them, so you multiply that. Condition the fact somebody tries it, they repeat purchase them, you get all these and then you get these probability of becoming the regular consumer. And then what you do is, in order to calculate the market size that you need to affect, multiply this probability that you calculate for the regular consumers to the total market you get. And uh, if 
on an average, people purchase small N units each time they go and purchase it, then lo and behold, you have the gross market size. That's the simple way to do it. But getting these probabilities is a tricky part because oftentimes what you get is people's attitudes towards it. You cannot see people's behavior, so you're gonna ask them for, and based on their estimates of uh, how likely they're to buy, then you have to estimate how many of those will translate to actual purchases. Um, so the implementation of these models are basically they try and find some way to simulate awareness, some way to simulate try, and then some way to simulate pre-purchase and get these probabilities or these transitional probabilities, if you will. Let's talk about the first model, which is the Bayes model. Bayes, they have two stages. The before use of the product and after use of the product. They simulate before use of the product and they ask you a few questions, and after use of the product, they simulate and ask you a few questions. Before use, uh, the, the, shop, you, the, the, the traditional model, um, and we'll talk about uh, how should this be changed for, uh, for uh, now the internet and your mobile purchases and so forth right now, and they are struggling with exactly the same kinds of problems. So if you look at before use purchases, um, what they do is um, they, they try and simulate using a shopping mall intercept. They intercept people at a shopping mall. That itself leads to some certain kinds of biases because certain kinds of shopping malls uh, attracts only certain kinds of clientele. Uh, but be it what may be, then you basically do a shopping mall intercept. You interview a few people. And, um, and uh, based on that, you screen people for category usage. But based on that, uh, those people that are screened in, then you present a concept to these respondents and ask for a set of like, dislike questions and trial intent, right? Again, it's an attitude, basically how intent are they to purchase it? It's not, you're not actually seeing them purchase it. And then basically you get the purchase intent, basically how likely are they to purchase it at a particular price and then how much they're likely to buy. Then these people are either offered the opportunity to buy the product at a discounted price or regular price, either in a simulated shopping kind of setup or they hand it out to them as a free trial. And then once people try the product, then they're asked a bunch of questions in terms of um, after use, how, how likely they like it, how much they're likely to repurchase it, and so forth. And based on these two, Basis tries to estimate what's the probability that somebody will try the product and what's the probability that somebody will repurchase the product. And they use sensible discounting factors, and we've talked about this in the concept test, which is basically that when somebody says, I'm strongly inclined to buy the product, what discounting factor do you use to say that these those with a strong at or very uh, strong attitudes are likely to end up purchasing the product of this behavior. And uh, they study, they use some, they're, they're based on their uh, database of other similar product categories. They use these uh, discounting factors of optimistic and pessimistic scales. Um, but in the whole process, they have not yet simulated awareness. And so that's a difficult proposition. So what they do is they ask these market, uh, marketing managers to provide with uh, estimation of how much they're willing to spend. Then they basically uh, look at um, uh, historical trends of uh, how much money can buy you in the DRPs in terms of awareness. And they look at certain distribution outlets that you can reach through your distribution outlets and they find out how much that will translate to. And uh, they find uh, some amount of awareness and availability. Okay, and what they then do is basically in, uh, in, in estimating this ad expenditure, we'll just take one part of it, right? What they do is they take similar product categories, they collect data, and they run a regression model that basically awareness is a function of your ad expenditure, but it's a logarithmic function that means that uh, it's a decline, meaning the more amount of money that you throw, it doesn't mean that you buy more awareness, you just hit the same person again and again multiple times. And uh, they estimate this and find uh, awareness. Uh, and they've they, they, they have, uh, by 1986 itself, they had a database of about 200 cases. And by now, they have thousands of cases. And the forecast that they claim is about 90% accurate. Um, but it's a tough job to forecast on a market that's not yet happened. And uh, we do have uh, some uh, case studies where uh, out of 22 cases that we studied, they've been pretty close in terms of how they've been forecast for um, the error rates uh, for news, so it's about 80.5% 80, 80 to stay that way, and uh, uh, basis is about 10% uh, and it has about 25% error uh, bars. Um, and then what they've done is they've actually been able to calculate and make good inferences over a period of time on uh, what's the relationship between marketing expenditure and awareness. So what's the, uh, what's the relationship between awareness and trial, and especially for certain kinds of product categories. Um, what's the relationship between like or scales that you ask for purchase intent and real trial? 
uh, because they actually track these people and actually find if uh, ask them if they want to be part of a panel and the track if they've actually purchased. Okay, so that's uh, the, the major uh, contribution is having this database. Let's get to the assessor, which will be slightly more um, detailed, if you will, in terms of how they do these steps. Here are uh, here's the procedure and the measurement at each of these procedure points. Mm, during the first pr stage, they do similar kind of screening, either at a mall intercept or through a random intercept. Uh, they, they, they basically screen and recruit people um, and uh, they measure for established brands that are already brands that exist in the space because no product uh, actually launches in, a, in an entirely new space. Um, and they ask for what do you think about the current brands? And during that time, they ask for composition set of the established brands. Some people have, have uh, let's say, a small little uh, consideration set, such as with CKO beverages out of the hundreds and thousands of SKUs that are available right now. You probably consider only five that you ask, uh, you rotate your purchase uh, now. And let's say a new Pepsi um, you know, product gets introduced um, uh, or a Coke Zero gets introduced. And basically, uh, then you ask exposure to advertising for this. And oftentimes, it's done in a competitive set. So... Uh, previously, they used to do it in a magazine where your ad would be embedded among the other ads. Uh, then they started moving towards, let's say, your pro ad uh, in the video form embedded in uh, a smaller capsule of ads when you're watching, let's say, a friend's serial. Right now, they're trying out various different ways that you can online ask people to consume, let's say, New York Times newspaper and embedded in that are these ads. And once they get these ads in a realistic format, they ask for people's reaction when you see the ad, and, uh, how many of you are aware of the, pr of the brand after you, and what did you, and your playback about the ads and so forth. Okay, and so that gives you some sense, uh, probability of unaware to aware, what's the transition probability. Then they basically give people a little bit of money, uh, the denomination amount oftentimes is ten dollars, but it could vary depending on the product category. And then they simulate a small little shopping environment, and uh, they claim it's good enough that you, even if you have four aisles with uh, products that are uh, uh, two or three products from each product category, is enough to simulate purchase as compared to having a Walmart-like setup where you have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of SKUs. Um, and then they ask for people's uh, purchase of this, and they simulate and ask uh, which ones do you want to buy, why, and so forth and they find the brands that are purchased. And prior to that, they also ask for likability and so forth so that they can condition the responses and say, maybe the people are saying that they like, they like to buy it, but they don't, uh, they don't seem to like it. So maybe the, the probability of them making this leap is gonna be lesser. Then, and for the people that don't pick up the product, uh, meaning if it's uh, very few people that actually go to the shopping and use the $10 to actually buy the product of choice, the new product that's gonna be launched, and one out of 100 people buy it, then for the rest of them, they actually give a trial sample and see if you were to basically seed the market with these trial products, would it lead to um, some amount of uh, purchase? And then they offer a purchase opportunity, which is basically that after they give it a little bit of time, the time is also important because how many usage occasions do you give? Um, so if, if you, if it's a shampoo product, you give them a month, you give them 15 days, you give them 10 days. If you give them 10 days, is it very little time? Only 50% of the market's tried it. If you give them a month, people have already tried it and they're already, and they're pulling back retrospective memory estimates of uh, how much they liked it. And so it's, uh, it's a diluted version of how they actually feel about the product. Um, and so things to think about, but uh, the thumb rule is give them at least three to four usage occasions. Um, and once you do that, then basically you consume the brand and post usage, you go back and ask them for uh, their uh, uh, likability and other kinds of feedbacks about the brand and the usage rates and satisfaction and preferences now with this brand embedded among the other brands in the market. And uh, you can read the note, it offers you a little bit more about uh, um, uh, simulated test marketing. But here's how they estimate it. So they, 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 then they take if they showed it to 100 people, only 10 people played back about the ad, that's the awareness that you calculate. Of those people, those 10 people that you would be given the $10, how many of them actually go up and then buy the product and they look at that probability. And then of those, then when you call back, how many of them are, real, are likely to uh, buy this product again or avail of the coupon that you provide them with. And so that offers you a repeat probability. And then they take these and they multiply these trial rate, repeat rate, and the usage rate because they ask how much they'll buy at each case and they come up with a market share for the product. In summary, both of these, the bases and the assessor, use the hierarchy of effects. And the hierarchy of effects is unaware to aware, aware to trial, trial to repeat, to predict market share. 
And uh, both of these are survey-based methods that they use the pre-use methods and post-use methods to make these predictions, okay? So we've seen a little bit about um, uh, simulated test marketing, um, and hopefully let's talk a little bit now about what, uh, how, how are these changing. So if you think about uh, now, most people are going, awareness is created through various different sources. Previously, the role of awareness was, was given to advertising. So advertising took on the role to create awareness for the product and to build assets for the product. But right now, people are going to shopping stores or retail stores to create awareness for the product. What, are, what is available? Then they go back to their homes to purchase, which means that they're not completing the purchase in the retail store. So the awareness is created in the retail store, one retail store, and uh, the purchase is done in another retail store. So that's another challenge that uh, Basie's and other assessor and other similar test marketing companies are, are uh, grappling with. Another way to think about it is uh, most of our consumption is done through multiple devices and and uh, uh, using different uh, formats. So how do we look at these ads and how do we become aware of these products and what uh, what's the role of, let's say, peer-to-peer? -peer? Uh, so for example, Facebook, some of these ads are being sent by your friends. That's very different in terms of how you look at these uh, as compared to how you look at it if it's shown on TV. So all of these are challenges that uh, most of these firms are, are facing and who knows what the future lies. But these techniques and the theory that it uh, taps into, I think will still hold. That's it for today. Thank you, guys.